and in opening government, we have Tel Aviv B. In op- In opening opposition, we have Oxford B. In closing government, Glasgow A. And in closing opposition, Oxford C. My name is Mivza, I'll be the chair for this round. Um, Paneling will be Stefan, Senna, Dan, Tom, Kalina and Olivia. Um, without further ado, I'll call upon the Honourable Prime Minister to begin this debate. Here, here. Vladimir Putin is the Kremlin. Vladimir Putin is the new Tsar. And cancelling a narrative of an overthrow of the Tsar and romanticizing the time of those Tsars helps Vladimir Putin consolidate power, helps Vladimir Putin have the economic policy he wants, helps Vladimir Putin achieve more power in Eastern Europe. And those will be my three points of analysis today. So, firstly, a a, a little bit about the Mecca. We suggest a complete rejection of both revolutions of 1917. We want statues of, of, of Lenin and, uh, and, of, uh, and of Stalin removed from state institutions and from seed cities in general. We want all of those symbols out of Russia and we will teach in schools and we will preach in television that every single part of the 1917 revolution was a tragedy that cost the lives of billions of people and facilitated a regime which was worse than the glorious times of the Tsar. To contrast that, we will romanticize and emphasize the good times that Russia had under Tsars, like both Tsars Alexander, when it expanded, when it protected all of those people who speak Russian and who are ethnically Russian in the world, and when it stood as a great beacon of its ethnicity and of its nationhood in the world. Personally, I think this would be a terrible thing for the world, but for Putin, this would be amazing. So, first, why would this be effective in creating the, in, 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 why, why could, can the Russian government be, be effective in creating this narrative? Firstly, we say that people in general hate communism more than they love it because all of them have suffered tremendously personally under it, whether it by direct, be directly under the power of the state or just because they can see the extreme poverty that was there, the lack of opportunity, the lack of choice, the cronyism, the fact, the, the, the deep, deep unfairness. And we say that this rides on that narrative in a very excellent way. How, how do we know this? Just by contacting Russian expats everywhere in the world, you can see this. Secondly, we say the Kremlin has huge control control of information in the entire Russian-speaking world and in Russia in particular. They control the news, they control the education, and they can be ef- extremely effective in manipulating all the information to only emphasize the negative elements of, the, of that rev- revolution. How do we know that they can be so effective in doing this? Just look at how Russian media is so effective in portraying to Russia, the, to Russians, the West. Russians think that, the, according, to, according to all surveys, Russians are in love with Putin, support him extremely, and, and, and think that the West would be extreme, and that the ways of the West would be extremely bad for them. Therefore, we think that efficacy is a non-issue for the Kremlin in this debate. Firstly, why specifically, why does specifically a narrative of a violent popular revolution threatening to Putin? We say that Putin wants to be the Tsar. And, the, and, and that his ticket for being the Tsar, his mandate for being the Tsar is twofold. First, firstly, national protecting all Russians, uh, advancing Russian nationalism. We know this by the way Putin expresses himself in media, but also we know this because of the actions in Georgia, because of the actions in Ukraine aggressively to protect Russian citizens in order to facilitate being stronger. Also, if they try to tell you that Putin is some dictator which doesn't care about the populace at all, we say that his uh, actions attest directly to the contrary. Putin is constantly concerned about his popular support. Putin is constantly vicious to every political right if he was not afraid of the people costing him his rule, he would not be so vicious in maintaining their 
support. Second ticket for Putin, a professional one. That's why we see all those shirtless photos of Putin, all those Putin is a better hunter than the best hunter in the world, Putin scoring a goal on the Russian, on the Russian national team goalkeeper. We say that both of, the, what, both of those are the mandate for Putin. What isn't the mandate for Putin is anything ideo ideological. In fact, ideology by its very nature threatens Putin because it is always bigger than the individual. And Putin wants to be the biggest individual, the only one who can protect the great Russia. We say, we, we say that he wants to teach and accustom the people to the idea that power lies in the top. And, 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 and we say that when you condition people to that idea, when you teach them that only the, the power is only in the top, the wisdom is only in the top, they are unable to think otherwise. When they grow to believe that power is to the top and that authority is to be trusted from a very early age, they internalize that for the vast majority of people. Why is the communist narrative such a threat to that? Because it is a story like poison within the head of every Russian saying that, that you, the country, belongs to you. Russia belongs to you. The, all, the, all the money, all the goods, all the natural resources belong to you. And you are bigger than the government. And you know how you take it back if you are unhappy with power, with violence, with force. This is an idea so powerful that it facilitated the original revolutions of 1917 and it is threatening to, and, it, and it may threaten to facilitate those same revolution in Putin Russia in Putin's Russia again so yes. therefore if he erases that he limits people's abilities to think he becomes the new tsar and creates a generation of people who could never even contemplate revolution go as much as debaters find it easy to rely on Putin's strong man analysis the Kremlin also has long-term interest in in the long term. There, do you think it's healthy to build a cult of personality and deny the legitimate authority of predecessors to the state? So, firstly, we think that that doesn't engage with the case in any, in any way, and that we will have to get an answer for that entire case. Secondly, both my next two points. Why the Kremlin needs more capitalism? We say that Russia is an, e is an economical crisis, and in the world, it is proven that the sort of fin financial policies persevered, uh, like done under communism are not very effective in solving it. However, Putin has a problem that, co that, that because communist ideas are still so strong in Russia, the economic policy that the Kremlin may want to pursue is perceived as toxic. We say that this crucially cancels this out because it's, we suggest a complete rejection of that communism. They may say, well, just if you're so powerful, just educate the people to that. But no, the communist idea is so powerful that it will be in the back of their heads saying the government has to give you subsidies, the government has to give you food, and therefore will not enable them to introduce free competition and better the economic state of Russia, another threat on the Kremlin and another long-term interest for the Kremlin. Third long-term interest for the Kremlin here, we say that this that this makes Russian influence more accessible in the countries of Eastern Europe. Because again, those countries specifically who escaped communism, those are the countries for which communism is so toxic and for which communism is a political pariah. However, being pro-Russian is not. Those countries like Latvia having a 40% Russian population, like the Ukraine, like, uh, uh, and, and like others, and like others, have giant Russian-speaking po populations, and being pro-Russian and even pro-Putin and anti-West is a legitimate political standing there. However, once you stand with communism, your party has no chance of making it. We say that a complete rejection of communism by Putin enhances his ability to have more influence in other Russian-speaking countries, and for those reasons, this would be amazing for the Kremlin. Thanks. Thank you very much um, to the Prime Minister. Now to start the case for the opening opposition, I'd like to invite the Leader of the Opposition. Here, here. just a lot. <clears throat> this proposition's case would be hugely impactful if they thought, like 
perhaps not many of us on this side of the house, that Putin was currently in threat. Because otherwise, any argument that says we entrench Putin's position a bit marginally more really doesn't factor all that much into the Kremlin's decision-making process. Our alternative is simple. We would use the same extensive methods that they mentioned, but for an exact opposite purpose, to show that these revolutions were a triumph, to frame them as a movement of Russia from, from a past age of outdated monarchy into modernity, to a world in which the anti, to, to which the elite that were out of touch would be removed and that Putin would not do the same for fear of the same forces coming about. Look, context panel, Putin right now has the veneer of legitimacy under the very structures that are set up. That is to say, he has a veneer of legitimacy under democratic structures. To a degree, some nationalism and performance standards also fit the test. So the real question here is not who makes Putin marginally safer, it's about what is good for the Russian people and the Kremlin's direction for Russia going forward. Before two arguments, some responses. The first thing they told us is that this is about nationalism and professionalism. Clarification? Uh, clarification? Yep. So you're explicitly counter-propping, painting it as a triumph. You're not going to hold on to the current Kremlin position of being neutral. Uh, no, I think the motion does call for us for the, to have that clash. I don't want to piss off the CA team. Some members of the panel uh, on the panel are from the CA team. So, <laughs> note that if the idea here is to associate yourself as Putin with nationalism and professionalism, the last Tsar to be removed from the Romanov family, Tsar Nicholas II, was terrible at both of these things. He was extremely unprofessional, they were fighting a losing war, people's needs were not being met, and the expansion of Russia by that point had stopped, and in fact, because of World War I, was being beaten back by the Germans. It suggests to us, therefore, that a disassociation from this previous Tsarist regime, the one that was literally removed by the might of the people, was a good thing. Why is it a good thing? It is a good thing because it suggests to the Russian people that Putin is willing to accept that weakness will not be tolerated and that he will be the exact opposite of that. That that is not what I am offering the Russian people and I'm willing to back a narrative that says if I do concede that, I should be removed. That is a position of strength that Putin has consistently uh, sort of used to gain legitimacy. We want that to continue. The second thing they say is that they need to mitigate the threat of a revolution happening again because revolutions destabilize regimes. This argument is true in a vacuum and arguably true for any government in the world. The real question we have to ask is, is this currently a real threat in Russia right now? To the extent that I I just don't think it is because of the framing we've given you that isn't a big deal. Last of all, that they need more capitalism. Capitalism. Look, celebrating these revolutions does not mean celebrating the regime or the Soviet Union, the USSR that came after. More crucially, it might celebrate parts of that regime, but not necessarily the communist aspects of it. If you think about the fall of the USSR, no thank you, they have been hugely capitalist Russian leaders in the past who have said, we do need to modernize the economy and move forward. It is not clear at all why their side would increase the degree of capitalism in the Russian economy in a way that since Russia, uh, the, the Kremlin already has so much control over would make a significant difference. No, thank you. There's no point making an argument of perceptions if the very premise of your case is that the perceptions of people don't matter all that much to Russian decision-making. Two arguments. Number one, I want to further the argument that this destabilizes the Kremlin on the comparative on our side. It entrenches their position, winning on OG's metric. But second of all, I just want to make the claim that this was a triumph for the Russian people. And to the extent that the Kremlin seeks a degree of legitimacy by caring for the needs of their people, you should go with our side. Premise of the first argument, no thank you. Look, you might have to discredit the Soviet Union, but you'll have to discredit certain parts of the Soviet Union en masse if you want to claim that this was a total failure. You have to discredit things like the USSR trying to gain influence over satellite states or protecting Russian-speaking peoples way more effectively than the failing Tsarist regime at the point it was removed. That is the real comparison in this debate. Now, this is inconsistent with the current goals that legitimate the current government. For one, the Putin government isn't democratic by any means, but it does hold elections and it does tell the Russian people that the vast majority of you did vote for my party. You lose that when you back a czarist regime that gives off any veneer of democratic legitimacy or power to the people. So the balance in Russia right now is that there is a veneer, no thank you, that works. Your side disrupts that. Second of all, this is not only about communism. The USSR regime did some things way better than that failing czarist regime. Things like gaining influence, like being able to fight wars overseas and fight off Western imperialism and Western demons. Now sure, they might say we lost this eventually, but the point is we can come back again and try harder. That that was the explicit mission of the USSR, which is consistent with the explicit mission Putin has today. Again, contrast that to the failing Tsarist regime. Question. No, thank you. That's not a clear win for Putin on their side. So look, for both of these counts, we empower the Kremlin's position because the Tsarist regime at the point at which it was toppled is the exact opposite of the deal Putin is offering its people today. The reason why Putin chooses to associate with the USSR in the status quo is precisely because that's where the consistent historical narrative lies. That empowers Putin. Okay. Opening. So we're assuming Goa's narrative goes something like this. 
This is a glorious revolution to free the people of a nefarious tyrant and seize the means of production, and by the way, has nothing to do with communism. How do you, what do you even justify? Are you for outside of this motion? Wait, sir, I, I don't get it, right? But, but, but more importantly, our, our point is, on our side, we still celebrate more of it than you do. We can pick and choose what the right bits to celebrate are, and I've justified why on, on mass, it's a good thing. Let's get to the communist thing in just a bit, because we are going to take that burden on as well. The point here is that this was a triumph, even if the end result was communism. The point here is it's about comparatives, as all of you should know by now. Look, why should we care? There is an interest in national history and culture as the Kremlin. You're not de facto Putin. You, don't, you can't equate them to be the same thing. We think countries should generally celebrate good things, national achievements, and things which increase their self-esteem. Note, the comparative to communism was a monarchy that had proven itself terrible over centuries. It was a Romanov dynasty which at that point was failing and sucked in every single thing they wanted to deliver to the Russian people. It was a contrast between starvation of peasants on the streets of Moscow versus the age of excess in the towers and palaces that existed there. We think in general monarchies are illegitimate and perhaps communism didn't work out in its execution, but in terms of throwing off the excesses of the past, in terms of throwing off illegitimate government and moving to something which, this is crucial, the people at the time thought was a bold, fresh, innovative, and an improvement to their lives, that's something worth celebrating in your national history. Note, at the time, and like put yourself in the position of someone in that era, communism had not been discredited in the way it was today. It was fresh, bold, and an idea that required courage. It might, in some cases, be the version of the liberal left that we look at now and aspire to be. Now, note, obviously with hindsight, we can say that didn't work out in terms of execution. But in terms of celebrating the sacrifices and decisions of those people on the ground at that moment to risk death, to risk a loss of li livelihood in order to put a better future on the table for their children and their great-grandchildren, we think that's a great thing. Why is this so important? Because it matters massively to all the people whose generations ago, whose great-grandparents died in that sacrifice. When these stories are passed down for them, it makes them feel like that was a sacrifice and a success that the entire country can take pride in, to join in the rest of the world in throwing off the shackles of an illegitimate government. For all of these reasons, I think on both these counts, I'm very proud to oppose. Thank you very much to the leader of our position to continue the case for the deputy prime, uh, the opening government. I invite the deputy prime minister here. Here. Okay. Our case is, at the very least, odd. Here's what they say. We can take the entire idea of communism in Russia, right, history of 78 years, and just choose this little aspect, spin it as the characteristic of that regime, spin it as it was positive, under, uh, unlike what actually happened, and then portray specifically that part of the people, and that's fantastic. Obviously, if OO can do all of that massive brainwashing and deletion of history, we can take the same parts of the Tsarism, and the debate is awash because it doesn't matter at all. OG, OO, in this debate, have to support, and we'll show you what is inherent to supporting communism as a triumph. Let's make it clear, though, as OO agree, the comparative is portraying communism as a triumph. We don't have, we could support out of the government side doing nothing. But when asked whether you would rather portray it as a tragedy or a triumph, oppositions have to defend portraying it as a triumph. So, actually, most of the engagement is actually done by that point. Because you don't get 
any answers to the case by, brought by my partner besides saying, well, we'll get the benefits under our side considering we have a very weird way into looking into the world. Let's look at what is inherent to communism what, for viewing communism as a right and why it is a risk for the Russian regime, for the Kremlin regime. And then we'll try to prove that actually we have an obligation to portray it as a tragedy and follow the mechanism. No, thank you. So firstly, what we've told you and got ignored specifically. When you portray communism's triumph, two things are likely to happen, considering the Russians aren't stupid and know history to an extent. A, it is the victory of the people over, and, uh, over the Tsar as a person who controls the country. It is the giving power specifically to the people on the expense of the, peop of the one who used to control it. Secondly, obviously it means communism, right? When you have full control of the economy and the process and the labor as a whole through the idea that the people are the ones in control of it. This is exactly why the entirety of our case Point. goes unanswered, right? Because we tell you why the concept of communism, why the concept of communism as a tragedy is likely to undermine all of this, where you're getting more political power within, where you are less likely to suffer from revolts from within, where you get power outside. All of these go unanswered. But what is the challenge we get? But why is communism such a threat? A, it doesn't have to be such a threat for us to rather it, to have it, prefer it over the other side. But secondly, here are a couple of reasons of it being a threat. A, the economic crisis in Russia currently being portrayed, right? The idea that the Russian regime is being excluded in international agreement, in, in economically, and the fact that the, economy, the Russian economy is shrinking right now, specifically sp portraying the communism as a triumph, is what is going to cause legitimacy for the people from within to try to overthrow, try to act in a way that will remove the Kremlin for, from power. Secondly, a lot of the resources right now don't go to the masses and go, don't go to the many of the people, meaning the idea of communism specifically undermines the ability to continue that and is therefore a threat. Thirdly, we say poverty in Russia as a catalyst for that sort of thing. And fourthly, we tell you, when you glorify Point. and use it as a triumph, this is when you say that money belongs to you. Those resources are yours. The power should be yours to decide. That is when you get the, the, the harms under our side of the house. But moreover, we tell you, when we show that Putin, when Putin shows that he is uh, never mind. Okay, let's move on to our second what? case. Actually, before that, I'd love an, any engagement with closing. So, the main opposition to Putin is Alexei Navalny, who is mobilizing opposition on anti-corruption protests, pushing for more liberalism. Why do you think communism, which is the only party that Putin allows to stand in major elections freely, is the main threat that he faces? I think your PY just proved it if it is the only party currently opposing him. We don't get why it is likely not to be the case. But secondly, I have no idea what it does comparatively in the debate, right? Proving that there are no large impacts to the debate doesn't mean that oppositions win it, considering they have to support showing it as a triumph. Let's discuss why we believe it actually the Kremlin is obliged, obliged to do that. So, Obviously, the communist regime was a horrible regime for the people who underwent it, right? Millions of people died. There were gulags. People were basically unable to gain any sort of liberties and freedom for their own lives. Hunger was widespread and famine was a popular thing, not a problem, but was widespread in Russia. What we tell you specifically on that is that there are still people who remember that, who are still people who have undergone that or have some sort of memories of that time and that suffering. We tell you when the current Kremlin doesn't show explicit opposition to the idea of communism and that regime, which both oppositions obviously can't support. This is a, a, sh a sign from that regime. It is okay and legitimate that that time in history, those sort of things were okay. But moreover, we say it is when it is at that point, it is more likely for symbols of that regime to appear when people celebrate it on the street continuously. When you have to see again and again a reminder of no, thank you, a reminder of that time when you suffered. 
under our side of the house, considering no engagement whatsoever with the efficacy, A, in the long term, in the long time it reduces, but B, even the mere stance by the Kremlin, who is supposed to be representing, even in Russia, of the people by their own idea, it is enough to tell them, you do, we don't, the current regime does not think it is okay. We say, we say under our side of the house that these sort of symbols, the portrayal and the legitimization and the fact that you are not actively opposing it is in a lot of cases like a hate speech against these people. It is a reminder of the suffering they've had on a daily basis and the traumas that have occurred. And it is for all of them also a reliving of that. So we say that as we've shown to you and it's agreed on the both sides of the house that Putin cares about the Russian people, he should oppose that. Now opposition what might say, well, people have undergone bad things under the tourism as well. A couple of reasons why that case isn't symmetric. Firstly, there are no strong symbols to represent Tsarism under their side, of, under our side of the house. That would be a reminder of that. Secondly, it is not a scenario as significant as the communist revolution itself. But thirdly, the people who have suffered from the Tsarism are dead in most cases. They are unlikely to suffer the consequences of the communist symbols still being there. We say it is better for the Kremlin. They are obliged to do that. Please support. Thank you very much. Now invite the deputy leader of the opposition. Here, here. Panel, it took until the last 10 seconds of that speech for opening government to finally realise the comparative and say that the reason was there were not symbols of Tsarist oppression. What did the opening government do when they chose to celebrate Tsarist oppression? They brought back those symbols, they put up the heads of those Tsars, they reminded them of the corrupt Tsars that, that, that uh, the modern Russian state and its predecessors overthrew. Two things in this speech. Firstly, on the security of the Kremlin, uh, broadly talking about both of Texas points and responding to material from opening government. And secondly, a new frame in which opening opposition will win this debate about how this strengthens the Kremlin's international position, firstly, on security. Opposition here, so government has two lines here. The first is the claim that there's a threat in communism and what the revolutions represent via com communism. And secondly, on revolutions. They claim here that you cannot eliminate the worst parts of communism in your selective portrayal here. As text observed, the problem is symmetric to the extent that the worst parts of Tsarist Russia were also in the kinds of strongman things this opening government would highlight. It looks a lot like the modern Kremlin when there was a large, lazy elite that had huge amounts of capital, a lot of people slaving away for very little. When they claim that there were likely to be no symbols, when you re-erected the statues of Catherine the Great, when you re-erected the statues of Peter the Great, we thought those were likely to come. But the second thing to say here is we do not think this debate is about celebrating communism. It is about celebrating a particular event that led to the USSR. The USSR, as we told you and was unresponded to, meant a lot more than communism. It was a geopolitical entity that stands for a lot of things that the modern Russian state stands for today. Things like fighting the West, things like unity from, from, from Asia all the way into Europe, things like a large and expansive state that had control and huge amounts of political clout. The last thing to say here is obviously that you can have nuances in the way that you're controlling that history. And importantly uh, uh, here, the alternative to the Kremlin's ownership of the history of communism is the ownership of the revolutionaries opening government acknowledges might be happening. It is a historical fact that cannot be denied that there were a series of revolutions in that time. So if that is the case and they have some kinds of political clout, when the state is accused of eroding an important part of Russian identity that we should have pride in, and to the extent that it is unsavory, it is in the Kremlin's interest to control, control that mechanism. Um, that. that means that on the grounds, the opposition parties taking up the banner of communism are likely to have more strength when they cannot choose what elements of it to separate it and when the Kremlin totally disowns one of the most important periods in its history. Their second claim here was that 
destabilise the Kremlin because it was an example of a revolution. No. We told you that it was an example of progress. It was a turning point where you decided that you wanted something better, that you wanted something. In the same way that the American Revolution was not perfect, replacing King George many, many miles away with a ruling and racist elite, this opposition does not need to defend the very worst elements of communism. You can say that at the time, it looked like a pretty good move for the Russian state and had lots of benefits that are continuing to be reaped today. Lastly, like government hasn't proved why a revolution is particularly likely to occur or weigh that up against the benefits to national unity that make that revolution less likely. Because for every neo-communist they say is empowered by this, we think a lot of Russians who can take pride in a time when their country decided that they wanted better is equally likely to make, in fact, more likely to make that, uh, to, to prevent that revolution. The last claim they claim here is that Putin is particularly Sorry. on kind of the, the, the position they run, I'll take you in a moment, moment closing, consistently, is that Putin is empowered by being able to draw analogies to those racist, uh, the, the ruling elite of the, the 1800s. When you're looking at the one that history broadly takes as an unnationalist, lazy, that put Russia in a costly war, that saw people who were notice the distance of time and symbolism of World War I is pretty similar to that of the 1920s communism and the Bolshevik revolution, you're more likely to be acknowledged by that and you empower those when you do not control that narrative. Closing. Uh, Techway attempts to mitigate all of OG by pointing out it's marginal because Putin and the Kremlin are under no imminent threat of revolution. Given that's the case, why isn't the past 11 minutes of both of your speeches equally irrelevant as everything they've said? Well, it's stabilising. It's good to have a strong national identity. We acknowledge that in the long run, the interests of the Kremlin, unlike your opening government who committed to the interests being Putin, were far more than that, and having a strong Russian state was good for that. Secondly, further on why it is good, not just in preventing it, but in answer to your POI, why we strengthen the Kremlin's international position, we make Russia a more prosperous place. The first thing here is looking at regional neighbours, ex-USSR states, states like Georgia, states covering the Urals, states like Estonia, for instance. The context here is they were also under the heel of Tsarist Russia, suffered from immense oppression due to imperialist expansion under the reigns of Catherine the Great. Yes. They fell into the sphere of influence, no. And, and we think, importantly here, the thing to say, and like that went all up the way up to the 1917, the thing to say here is it is preferable for Russian interests that they be seen as a power of liberation, of progress, of one of modernity and not one of Tsarist oppression. And that just okay. means that when you're looking at, as opening government acknowledged, the protection of Russian speaking peoples, yeah. when you have huge, you no know, economic interests in things like gas pipelines, you're more likely to be helping a Russian speaking person on the ground in a country like Ukraine see Russia as one that is not a uh, op 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 oppositional to their interests. Where those states are democratic, you're more likely to be seeing them you know, cooperating with Russian interests in the long term. Secondly, more broadly internationally, obviously to some extent, anyone who's been reading the news knows that Russia doesn't care hugely at all times about its reputation with countries like America. We think that the nuance of this is that Russia does not want to be seen wholly as, as a bogeyman by Western media. That looks like attempts to, for instance, befriend Trump, as comical as they might be, no, things like hiding corruption and attempting to appear legitimate on the terms of international institutions, looking like other great, such that other great powers can stomach it. We think a narrative of a state that's legitimacy is founded on a history of progress, on opposition to tyranny, is one that is good for that and allows that state to have more clout in international institutions. The last thing to say here is we don't think it's necessarily exclusive to look only at those revolutions. We posit that at the, the, that, that Russian narrative would have a nuanced perspective of what that communism looked like and what the fall of the USSR looked like in its wake. Our claim here is that at the moment, the Russian state as it looked like in 1916 and 15 is far more similar to Putin than that, that the communists did. That's something opposition uh, government has not engaged with. So what has opening opposition given you? If Putin is the metric or the very short-termist interests opening government want to prioritise in this debate, we control that by strengthening narratives that would exist otherwise based on historical facts and, and progress, and that prevents the stability, increases the stability. If it is about the long-term interests, we enabled a country to believe in its own progress and we provided it the international clout and stability to expand its sphere of influence. Proud to stand in opening opposition. Thank you very much, Deputy Leader of Opposition. Now I invite the Member of Government. Here, here.
Today from Glasgow University Union, three unique arguments. One, why we think this will deal with opposition from different ethnicities and areas in Russia, and why that is a significant concern us as the Kremlin. Second of all, why we think this helps us deal with internal opposition, crucially the communist opposition in the Duma, which are our largest threat to our long-term stability. And three, how this is a, a symbolic act that can help us reach some form of reproachment with the US without having to pull back from our international obligations. One, this must be understood in the context of, the, of Russia and the Kremlin's current strategic interests. One, stability. The legitimacy of the Kremlin is founded on the guarantee of safety to the Russian people. They guarantee very little else, so, so safety is the number one, secure, number one thing they must be able to guarantee. And secondly, potential economic reproachment with the West, but without having to do very much. They're not committed to making serious, to making serious international changes. The Kremlin is the co collected Russian security establishment, concerned with their own survival and greater legitimacy, which allows them to do more things, but also with the long-term success of that because that allows them uh, let, like that allows them to control and have more power most russians have mixed feelings about the revolution the civil war was bad a tragedy that killed millions of russians and pitted brother against brother but the great patriotic war was an instance in which russia was able to demonstrate a capacity to protect europe when it could not protect itself but post the cold war crucially russian nostalgia has shifted towards nostalgia of the czars watching your country collapse humiliated and effectively falling apart by accident defeating by a USA you had been told was evil meant that you looked back on the Tsarist period when Russia was the largest power in Europe which required every European state to be allayed against it before it could be considered but in order to slow it down when it defeated Napoleon when it was the greatest state when it was the greatest and fastest moving state in Europe that's why we need to act upon this now and need especially to recognize the concerns of our different ethnicities there are a number of there are a number of ethnicities and regions in Russia currently engaged in violent conflict Chechnya in particular but also Dagestan and Abkhazia, other areas closer to the Central Asian republics, where there's a very present threat of Islamic radicalism east of the Caucasus. For instance, the Russian theater attacks in the early 2000s, when the government had to intervene with tear gas to rescue theater goers from Chechnyan separatists. This is an undermining of, of Kremlin legitimacy, which founds itself on that it can guarantee security for Russian citizens. This is a direct threat to that. But the ancestral memory of suffering of these people passed down through generations as they battled to survive Stalinist genocide, Soviet oppression that began with the pogroms, that began with the pogroms against them and the revolution as they were seen to be connected with the czars because many of these ethnicities and many of these regions have special status underneath the czarist regime. The Cossacks were functionally autonomous. They have disparate, as a group, these, in, these, these uh, ethnicities have disproportionately high nostalgia for the czarist period. But un under the status quo, and especially under opposition's counterprop, that you explicitly endorse the oppression that began with that period, saying that, saying, that the, saying that the Russians who attempted to kill you, who attempted to remove you from your ancestral lands, are the people that we celebrate as Russian heroes. If we say that, this, that, that, that the acts that began with this revolution were wrong, that, they were no, that we, should, we should say that they were a tragedy, we think this is a huge symbolic act that can help pull these ethnicities closer to the mission of the Kremlin. It plays into their own narratives of suffering and oppression from the uh, from the revolution and allows them to attach personal charisma to Putin, but also think that the Kremlin recognized it. Opening opposition, uh, uh, opening opposition's alternative deliberately antagonizes these people, making them more likely to engage in a violence that undermines the legitimacy of the Kremlin. How does this help us deal with current political opposition? Opposition says, oh, but Putin's not under threat, so it's not important. Exclude, it's important Point. to understand, no thank you, why this must be done now and cannot be left till later. It cannot be left until the Kremlin is under threat, but must be, ex must, must be done as soon as possible. Russians will look back on their history with nostalgia no matter what. But as memories of the humiliation of the defeat in the Cold War fade, there's a huge danger that that nostalgia will shift towards the Soviet and communist period, towards thinking that the communists who founded, that who founded this new republic were heroes. But the communist party, crucial still exists. They are the second largest party in the Juma after Putin's own party. They are our largest potential threat. No one cares about the corruption guy. He gets made fun of, right? Like they ushered him into his new protest with a bunch of like medieval reenactors because they wanted to point out that he was not that he was not an actual political threat. But we need to indoctrinate a narrative as soon as possible that the communist period and crucially the people who made it happen were bad and not Russian and should not control the country. Because OO's alternative explicitly says that the explicitly says that the 
the longest, that the largest long-term threat to our stability are, and hold on power are heroes, and that the people who are heirs to their, the people who are heirs to their political ideals are in the Juma, and you could potentially turn your support towards them. We think undermining our legitimacy in that way would not be in the Kremlin's interest, and it must be done now before the nostalgia shifts towards the towards the Soviet period. Techway. The removal of colonial powers in Southeast Asia was immediately succeeded by things like internal unrest and conflict triggered by the Cold War. I still think it is a good idea to celebrate these events happening anyway because they're not necessarily endorsements of everything that came after. But that was a tragedy. That was a tragedy. The fact that those people were pursued to death was a tragedy. And we should acknowledge the fact that they have passed on that suffering generation by generation and that they feel so aggrieved they are willing to engage in violence against the state. Why do we think this allows us to engage in potential economic rapprochement with the USA? We already know that Trump is on board. The number one question is the Republican establishment who are especially anti-communist and concerned about Russia's external actions. Crucially, this is a big symbolic step that the Kremlin can take without having to pull back on any of its international behavior, which it's not interested in. It's not in our interest to pull back on anything else, but this allows us to make a large symbolic step that says with, that says we are against every single one of America's cultural fears. Americans don't have any cultural fears about the czars. They have significant cultural fears about the communists, about Lenin, about everyone who tried to overthrow the Russian government. So when we say, when, so when we as the Russian government say this was a tragedy and these people were bad people and the communists were bad people and we'll put it on all the news media and we'll send it to all the Republicans. Hopefully we can get enough of them on side to do things like potentially repeal any of the economic sanctions against us, which we could sell as a massive victory for, for the, which we could sell as a massive victory for the Kremlin to our people, and also reach out to a government that is desperately in favor of us, but needs a number of its voters in the legislature to come on board. So a symbolic action would allow them to defend themselves by, by allow them to, def to defend themselves in that way, but without having to lose any of the number of benefits we have from our international act, from our international action. It has been an immense honor to speak in front of you, but a greater pleasure to do this with one of my best friends. Thank you. Thank you very much to the member of government. Um, now to start off the closing opposition, I'd like to invite the member of opposition. Here, here. We have heard from government that it is important that the Kremlin stay strong, stable, and respected by their people, and they gave us several benefits from that, which we are going to co-opt on our side of the house. We are also going to co-opt the benefits that we heard from opening opposition of making people better off. We think that's something that comes as a result of having a more stable country in which we believe it is in Putin's interest to lead. What am I going to talk to you about today? I'm going to tell you a bit about the context and the genuine threats that are actually facing the Kremlin and Putin. I'm going to talk a bit more about how you make a good campaign and why we think this is the most effectively done when you talk about triumph. And thirdly, I'm going to respond to some of the threats that I think we heard on the other side of the house that are a bit mischaracterized. So firstly, recognize that we're in a Russia where there is some threat of being deposed, there is some threat of revolution, and there is some threat in their somewhat of a sham of a democracy that if there's enough of a movement against Putin, he could be deposed. This is a very big threat to them because if it happens, they all go to prison and we think that that's something that they're particularly afraid of. We see marches now, anti-corruption marches often led by youth questioning Putin, especially given a very tumultuous time in global affairs and a struggling domestic economy in which many people are unemployed. What we see on our side of the house is an opportunity to capitalize on national unity and pride in a way that we think can keep Putin popular. Why is that? We think that the biggest threat, the things that people remember in their lifetime as an alternative to Putin, are someone like Yeltsin who came before him. And what we want to emphasize about Yeltsin is that he was someone who was, despite being democratically elected, terribly unstable and weak, right? The economy went down by 20%, and we want people to be reminded of just how grim that alternative have. We believe that we can do this by framing this as a launch of a new 1917 revolution over a fragmented type of state, instead of having a strong state, much like was achieved then. Why is this particularly helpful as a comparative? What we would say is that this revolution allowed the juxtaposition of those who were strong and took over 
over rather than the weak. Someone like Yeltsin can be adequately compared to the Romanovs, who didn't really have as clear of an agenda, wasn't as good as at keeping it in place. And Putin, similarly, like those who overthrew um, the Romanovs, is someone who got rid of Yeltsin, got rid of the weak, got rid of someone who was incapable of running the country well, and in doing so, made sure that things were centralized, decreased dissent. Things that we see draw genuine similarities with how Putin rules in a way that we think is credible to the people. This is particularly important for two reasons. One, we think that this helps characterize in the minds of the youth why it is important that he stays in power. But second of all, a lot of the adults that are there now actually lived under Yeltsin. Recognize also, in response to closing, the only people who even support the Communist Party are the really old people who are like 60 and still want their pensions promised from the USSR. They are not generally popular, right? We think that it's only among the older ones who we think seeing this comparison with Yeltsin would actually move closer to Putin. And with the younger who we think seem more angry, seem to be in these marches against corruption, they may be won over seeing that the alternative, it's much more grin. In this way, we think the kind of counter movement we're incentivizing, it's much better. Second of all, we have as much fiat as government does in shaping this story, and there's been a lot of analysis about how we're each going to use the facts that are beneficial to us. I'm going to prove why in a case of triumph, it is easier to use facts that are beneficial to you in a way that they will not be disregarded by your people. It's for four reasons. First of all, when you are giving people stories of glory, they feel more secure and less likely to question it. This is why Veterans Day constantly brings up questions of what we did wrong in North America, whereas something like Thanksgiving, despite also celebrating something that you could see as a tragedy, on part of Native Americans. It's something people rarely question. They'd simply rather enjoy the fact that they're celebrating, not question it, take it as a holiday, and so they're less likely to have those thoughts. Second of all, it emphasizes the idea that they are inherently capable of doing something great and creating a strong state. These are feelings that give people existential security in a way that we think is particularly beneficial, as opposed to making them doubt whether or not they can be strong, doubt whether or not there's another impending tragedy happening in their country. Third of all, we'd say that it inspires unity, right? Because at the point where you can say, look what Russians did together, that was impressive, I think it's better than encouraging disassociation from something that was tragic and unfortunate. We would say that people actually did like Stalin, um, and people did see a lot of benefits coming from the government that was communist. What we're going to do is emphasize the fact that it was because it was strong, not because it was communist. The economy grew substantially larger. They had a lot more clout on the global stage. These are the types of things we'd use that government fiat to emphasize, such that it becomes a story of glory, which we think we can. And lastly, we think you get a lot more confirmation bias where people are just happy to hear about things that they've done well, rather than they are um, to hear about something that they've done poorly. That's the kind of thing that makes them question, read more into the facts, and potentially pull apart that narrative. Insofar as you believe that either of us has control over the facts, we'd rather pick the one that's going to encourage people to more passively accept the ones that we feed them. Yes. Side government supports bashing the revolution and glorifying the Tsar. Side opposition supports glorifying the revolution and bashing the Tsar. How is your case in the debate? Okay, so our case is in the debate for a couple of reasons. I think opening told you it's important for the people of Russia to feel stable, content with their country, that it's important for them to have pride in their country. All of these things are the same. We're just leveraging them within the context of what are the facts of global affairs right now. I think if we have a stronger Putin, if we have less anti-Putin marches, if you have a more stable country, from the eyes of the Kremlin, that is the best possible Russia that you can have. I don't see how this could possibly not be in the debate. Furthermore, let's talk about the idea of communism. Because right? I think I've told you there are people who see great things about communism, and it's mostly old people who actually make this a genuine threat, which I think makes the characterization we hear out of closing a little weak. Furthermore, they say communists are our greatest threat, but also people have more nostalgia about the SARS because they don't like communists anymore. I'm hoping that they're willing to resolve this. But on either side, analytically, we're both telling you that we have a huge amount of control over the narrative that we have. I think there's no reason for them to dislike the SARS or dislike the revolutionary forces more, if it, or, 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 or dislike the communist forces more, if we're particularly controlling the facts we tell them and how we tell them, and we make the kinds of comparisons I told you we would in my extension. Furthermore, we heard that there's a fear of counter-revolutionary forces on the side of government. What I think we need to do, because we're always going to hear about counter-revolutionary forces globally all the time, people will be aware of this, is ensure that that's not something that people see as indigenized, particularly because they're going to have this new idea of a stable state being the most important. Don't create dissent if you're going to take away from a strong state something that Putin give, can give 
give you, unlike what Yeltsin did. Because of the parallels we uniquely draw, and because of the weakness that people see in the, re in the most recent ruling of Yeltsin, I think that's going to be the most likely outcome. Lastly, they said we should fear ideology. I think people are always going to have an identity, and insofar as they are, you want to make sure it's a Russian one, you want to make sure it's a united one, and you want to make sure it's one in favor of Putin. And I think you do that best by trying to make them feel positive about being Russian and linking to that to the kind of stability and strength that only Putin can bring them. I am very, very proud to stand on our side of the House today, and I hope you vote inside of opposition. Thank you very much to the member of opposition. Now invite the government whip. Here, here. Both sides of this debate have now agreed that the winner of the debate is the one who best proves whether what their side does to prop up the material interests of the Kremlin, both now in terms of maintaining Putin in power and going forward, whatever his successes might be. I think Bethany wins this debate then for two reasons. First of all, because she shows that this is a uniquely symbolic gesture which can be used to stop or at least mitigate or reduce the threat of violent terrorism from dispossessed, Russian minority, from dispossessed minorities still within the Russian Federation. And secondly, because it can, prove the relationship with the, uh, can improve the relationship with the West, which is also going to be crucial to helping Russia improve its economic position, perhaps help to diminish the threat of sanctions or the threat of conflict with the West going forward. With that in mind, those are going to be my two points of sum. Uh, first of all, several responses to what we've just heard. Okay, I would point out on the clash over the extent to whether we can pick or choose, like, you know, can we regret the Russian Revolution without regretting everything about communism? About communism? I'd point out, like, one, I think OG have fear to this, but two, like, j just analytically, we call it the communist revolution for a reason, right? Like, like, it's not like there was randomly a revolution then, oh, oh, oh God, communism happened. Like, it was very clearly part of the stated purpose. But Regardless, I think Bethany wins it, even if you don't accept that, even if you think they could pick and choose, because the violence that was visited upon Chechens, upon Abkhazians, upon Cossacks, happened as a direct result of the revolution. It happened in the couple of years that followed during the Civil War. Similarly, much of the Western fears, much of the sort of uh, hatred of communism that stoked, comes from the unique violence of the revolution. The fact that the Tsars were massacred, the ruling classes of the West fear the same fate. Okay, responses. First of all, Techway tries to marginalize the entire OG case by pointing out that um, Putin or the Kremlin are not under imminent threat. That we have a number of techniques we can use to deal with. We can use to deal with. We can use to deal with them. Uh, we, we, we can use to deal with opposition going forward. He then gives a whole bunch of reasons as to why, in fact, this is a point that falls on his side. But but I point out for the same reason he gives as to OG why it's marginal equally applies to his case as well. So we don't particularly think that you know the Russians are much concerned by the democratic legitimacy of Putin. I don't really seriously think anyone believes that for a moment. Similarly, that this could be portrayed as a rejection of weakness. Like there were strong czars before uh, before the sort of before the weak Romanovs. He could equally appeal. He would equally uh, appeal to them. But I think Bethany explains that insofar as they are, insofar as this does sort of engage any sort of opposition or does have a meaningful impact on any opposition movement, it's likely to be the Communist Party, the Russian Communist Party, who can literally claim to be the heirs of this, who, when all of the resources of the Russian state are pushed towards pushing a certain narrative, that is one that props up the guys who are literally the communists, the guys who are literally doing the revolution. So I think even then it falls on our side of the house. Secondly, we're told that this could help Russians to feel good. I would point out, again, we can comparatively do this on our side of the house as well. We can refer to the fact that Russia created the greatest land empire ever, stretching over the entire Eurasian continent. We can point to things like the defeat of Napoleon as being something that Russia uniquely stood against the world and was still able to destroy them. But I'd also point out, like, I just don't think Russians feeling good is ever something that's been in the interest of the Kremlin, right? Like, I think if that was, it wouldn't be the Kremlin, it wouldn't be oppressive in the way that it did. In, in the way that it did. So, the extension that we then get, basically, so we get a couple of full things on the extension. One is just a rehash at this point, that to say, well, we want to refer to the glorious history of a strong, uh, uh, of a strong state, we don't want Yeltsin, etc., to capture this narrative. But recognize, we do want Russians to doubt the gloriousness and the strength of Russia if it came from revolution, if it came from people overthrowing the established state, if it came from people standing up against authority. We want to show, like, like we want to show that the Russian Revolution led to Yeltsin and led to its weakness. So we can use that same stick against any pro-democracy protests against Russia today, against anyone who might try to protest against the against the Kremlin. Again, to the extent that's a narrative, it falls on our side of the house. The second claim then appears to be, well, maybe it will piss off some 60 
60-year-olds who support communism. I would point out these are less impactful for a couple of re uh, than the younger generation Bethany talks about, the people whose minds we need to change going forward for a couple of reasons. One, these 60-year-olds are all going to be dead soon, so if we're considering going forward, if we're considering going forward, they're less of a threat now. But two, people who are extremely elderly are unlikely to take to the streets or be uh, active in overthrowing a government. You need young people, you need people who are fit, are, who are fit and able to do this on their side on their side of the house. So, is, so if the comparative is that we annoy a few older people who liked communism a bit, but if we're able to stop the younger generation from becoming nostalgic for communism, if we're able to use the resources of the Kremlin to start changing their minds and change that narrative now, before the memories of the last days of communism fall, before the memories of the fall of communism and how bad it was, we think that is a net win for security on our side of the house. Okay, two Point. points. Then. First of all, let's look at the question of the international position. So um, this seems a slightly strange case from Sophie, because she basically runs like, well, their regional neighbours like Estonia didn't like the Tsar because they was mean to them, uh, so we should change this. Newsflash, they also didn't like the communists because the communists were worse. Like, Specifically, during the revolution, the Red Army crossed into Estonia, massacred citizens, and sacked Tallinn precisely because the Estonians had backed the whites, and there were white generals, and there were white generals popped up here. But secondly, I, I just think it's so, so marginal, even to the extent that they could win this. Like, like the Baltic states have a number of real material concerns to be afraid of Russia. That a small act of symbolism is unlikely to make any difference. Crucially, though, as Bethany explains, where a small act of symbolism could make difference is in the stance of the West, and particularly the United States of America. Why? Because that is to say, the USA, given that the Cold War is over, no longer has rational material concerns to fear from Russia. In fact, we have cooperation on a number of, of, a number of interests. Both Donald Trump and the Kremlin come from similar political traditions of right populism and fascism. Uh, they're both cooperating militarily in Syria, given that Islamic extremism is seen as the main threat. Additionally, constraining China, or ba at least balancing against China, is likely to be in something that's in the interest of both the USA and, the, uh, and Russia going forward. So specifically, making a symbolic change to the West, showing that we've moved on from communism. You don't have to be afraid anymore. Recognize the important because of the way in which Americans were educated to fear communism, the way in which they were raised during the Red Scare and the McCarthyite purges to specifically fear this. This speaks to deep ancestral fears. So when they see the Russian state glorifying okay. communism, flying the hammer and sickle again every year when this is shown on Fox News, that makes them more afraid of Russia. That makes them more likely to support things like sanctions or conflict with Russia. Recognize sanctions could be a threat to the legitimacy of Russia because if they do enough damage to the Russian economy, then that's when you can prompt people to revolt. That, like when the economy takes enough harm. So we think this is significantly important. Uh, I'll move on to the second claim, but First, tech wave. This is about the 1917, i.e. not communist revolution. This is not about communism or monarchy. You have to prop the idea that keeping the weak and inept Tsar Nicholas II was a good idea for Russia. No, 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 look, uh, I think I've just dealt with this already. It is impossible to disassociate a communist revolution from the communism that follows, or at least to the extent that it is, that also then hurts a number of your, uh, a number of your instances going well. I also just think Gov have fiat, right? Like, OG did fiat that they were also regretting communism and tied this to the motion, which he then chose to oppose. So secondly, let's talk about the meaningful reduction of violence. So we talked about the separate now, th these people were not oppressed under the Tsars. They were or, or not oppressed any worse than your average Russian was. They were given significant degrees of autonomy to have their own religion and stuff. It was specifically the atheist communists who then sought to massacre and attack them during the revolution. Again, because they were seen as dissident nationalities, people who could be a threat to the Red Scare. Recognize, a symbolic gesture to these people is hugely important in terms of mitigating things like terrorism and violence. Why? Because symbolic acts are uniquely useful in allowing people to become terrorists. You don't just become people from terrorism overnight. You use symbolism. You use things like planes hitting the twin towers. You use things like the image of soldiers over your mosque. You use things like the image of Russian soldiers wearing red, uh, wearing red flags with a hammer and sickle, which are now flying again in Moscow today under their side of the house, marching through your country to kill your people. Even a little bit, again, because a little bit of violence harms the sort of the legitimacy of the Kremlin, which is based upon security and being a strong man. Again, for the last time, from the finest circuit, with the finest institution, with the finest partner I could possibly hope for, propose. <laughs> Thank you very much um, to the government whip. Now for the final speaker of this EUDC Open Finals, I'd like to invite the opposition whip. We had to make a strategic call as the Kremlin as to what the greatest threat to our power is. 
Government bench seems to think that Putin is most worried about the second coming of Lenin. What we do in closing opposition is look at the actual, actual threat that he's trying to suppress at the moment. That is anti-corruption protests from young people who are worried that their standards of living aren't improving that they used to do in the past and that moving towards a Western-style democracy is the way to help them. What we said in closing opposition is that Putin has one great asset. That is that he, that the comparative in Russian history when they did have democracy, that is Yeltsin, was appalling. These are literally called the dark years. GDP collapsed, mafia gangs took over due to a weak state. We found this event as a unique way to stress a movement from a weaker state with weaker stars to a much stronger centralized state. This is a unique way to Putin to reframe the discussion in people's heads, away from being, could my life get better, to could my life get worse. That cuts off the main threat that the Kremlin faces and ultimately therefore guarantees the Kremlin's security. First of all, I'm going to look at that thing. What is the best strategy? Then I'm going to look at what matters most, but we think it's pretty obvious. Firstly, a point of important framing. Opening governments stand up and say, we are the Kremlin. We control the media. We can portray this as we want. We've got a huge amount of power, and people are likely to listen to us as we present it. We say, in opposing that statement, we obviously won't present it as they want to present it, because we've said that we want to show it as a triumph. And clearly, then, we don't need to show it as a triumph in a bad way. We don't say it's a triumph for democracy or a triumph for communism. We have presented an alternate route, we think a very compelling way to present this as a triumph in a way that boosts the Kremlin. What is that way? It is to stress the failures that were happening in the Tsarist regime under an increasingly weak decentralized state, losing the war to Japan in 1908, losing the First World War, um, to a state which was much more centralized with much stronger leaders. Note Stalin is huge, still hugely popular in Russia, and Putin explicitly talked about hugging back the USSR as a time for Russian greatness that he will bring back. We say that we will present this as a contrast, a contrast from weak government to strong government, and then also one that Putin will explicitly link in these commemorations to himself and the movement from a weak democratic Yeltsin to his government. Now, opening governments say there is a benefit. They say Putin can point to the good SARS and say, I'm a strong man, SARS can be good. We note that you can get just the same benefit by pointing to the greatness that happened under communism and linking that to being a strong man, the power, the fear that the USA felt of Russia, which they now, um, and the greatness that Russia experienced. We said that but there's an important comparison here. On their side, they can just say, look, strong men can be good. We say strong men can be good, but we bring a comparison. We say strong men can be good, but Russia's had some really weak men as well, and they have screwed this country over. Look at the downside in our history. So what is the impact of that? Debbie actually analyzes the threat that Putin faces. These are anti-corruption protests, protests due to, lowering, due to the lower standards of living that we saw in 2013 when hundreds of thousands took the streets due to high inflation that we see now under the anti-corruption marches by Navalny. Who are leading these? It is mostly the very young people who like, haven't gone through Yeltsin and at the moment they're under control. At the moment, still 80% sought support Putin. What is the risk though? The risk is that this grows, that older people, that adults, you know, in the 30 upwards bracket, start seeing Putin as bad, start seeing the corruption, which is obvious, see the like, scandal with Medvedev that has been covered widely and is known by lots of Russians, start thinking that there is a better form of life for Putin. What we do is we say that these same people lived through those terrible years. They lived through the horror of democracy. And this gives you a very powerful psychological mechanism to shift their focus from the upside that the young are advocating for to that downside that they lived through that comes with change, that comes through weak leaders, that Putin is very clearly seen as not beating. What does that mean? It cuts off those key democratic demographics of like people who lived through Yeltsin, which, as I say, is everyone from 30 upwards, from joining this movement, from getting the critical mass, which would ever lead either to an overthrowing at the ballot box through huge outturns for Navalny or through street protests. Um, and, and since that is critical demographic, we win it. What do they say? Um, but first, I will take opening government. Show you what, why this protects Putin against the idea that power belongs to the people, weakens opposition, and strikes Putin within and without. CG also adds that this also applies to minorities. Can I just say, can I just say, I think this is an important bit of rebuttal that I was going to get to. 
They are saying that this is framed as a moment to power to the people being great. To be clear, these revolutions, this revolution led to a very fragmented provisional government which, in, which within six months was overthrown by an anti-democratic wing which then controlled the country for the next 60 years. Who on earth is betraying this, even if they do see it as good, as a victory for democracy since it led literally within months to the breakdown of democracy and one of the most authoritarian regimes in the world? That narrative was just implausible. Now, getting onto this thing, you're going to stop ISIS terrorists from launching attacks because because, so, so the, the issue here, we can say that the Kremlin has a lot of power in how this is commemorated, but the people who listen least are probably those in ethnic minority communities where they speak a language different to Russian and probably have their own news sources, and they're so radicalized they are considering carrying out attacks on Russian citizens. Toby. Somehow I think if the Kremlin says something is good, this isn't going to be the thing that swings them. Furthermore, it's not clear that terror attacks do harm Putin, they help his strongman image. Then they talk about communists. First of all, Demi point, pointed out, while they do have a large of the vote, about 20%. It's a very particular demographic, which is old people who lost all their pensions under the USSR, which they were expecting, and old people don't grow as a demographic. For, well, old people from the USSR are just shrinking as a demographic. Second of all, to the extent that we play up their fears and link that terrible loss of their pensions and their living standards under Yeltsin, we think that's the way to get through to these people and to turn them against Putin. Furthermore, we've just said it's, not, it's clearly not the threat that Putin is worried about. So no found finally to weigh this, because here in closing opposition, uh, just note, just what Techway said is, first of all, that Putin is fairly stable. We say fine, that even if the downside risk is small, it's huge, in, uh, like the downside, if, if it occurs, it's terrible, because you literally end up in prison. Um, second of all, he says the impact of this is marginal. I think all commemoration debates can be seen as marginal to the extent they're a tiny part of people's formations. And therefore we conclude by saying, what is the Kremlin but its people? The organization of the Kremlin faces prison, they face even death if they are deposed and people expose their corruption. We say we need to stop that colossal downside in its tracks. We've identified the right strategy to do so. That is why we oppose. Thank you so much, the opposition whip. Uh, thank you so much, all four teams. Let's give another round of applause for, this fanta for the fantastic teams in this debate.